If you're a tech nerd like me, I'm sure you've heard people like me talk a lot about Raspberry Pis, Arduinos and ESP32s. But what's the difference? And why would you pick one over the other for a project? Those are the questions that I hope to answer in this very video, so strap in and let's get into it. Let's start with explaining what each of those categories even means, because none of those three titles are one specific product, at least anymore. I'll start with the Pis. Originally, the Raspberry Pi name was just a single product, a single board computer, or SBC, that took the maker world kind of by storm especially with this B plus revision, and even more so with the 3B, which added Wi-Fi, they are kind of what they say on the tin, single board computers. They take an SD card as their boot drive, boot their ARM CPU up and away you go. The key thing that the Pi offered from the get go was these pins. These are the GPIO headers, or general purpose input outputs, and these are what let the Pi communicate with all of the sensors, hats, mics, and the wonderful modules that people have made for these over the years. This is the magic that made them sell 100,000 pre-orders on day one, and what differentiates these from other small computers like Intel NUC style machines. These GPIO headers are also the reason that a lot of people compare Pis to Arduinos. The Pis diversified over the years though, mostly in form factor. There are two newer form factors, which are the Pi Zero or Zero W, which is a sort of pared down version of the Pi that keeps the GPIO, but drops most of the other IO, save for a mini HDMI port, two, I think, micro USB ports, the SD card reader, and a camera slash display connector. Those are lower power, as in CPU power, although also, you know, actual power consumption, with the original only getting 512 megabytes of RAM, so it's much more for a displayless sort of use or built into other hardware. The other form factor is even more expressly designed to be used with other hardware, the Raspberry Pi compute modules. The first mainstream one, the CM3, used a SODIMM style socket like laptop RAM, whereas the newer CM4 and 5 used two surface mount connectors that mean the compute module can just clip straight into a board. These forgo all I.O., save for those two board-to-board -board connectors, although these also add optional onboard storage, specifically eMMC storage. The newer Pis, the Pi 4 and 5, including their compute module versions, have taken a step towards being more powerful computers. While they still don't really compare to a more fully-fledged system like an Intel N300 or even N100, let alone a desktop or even laptop chip, there is a lot more horsepower available on these boards. For some, that's a bit of a shame, as it's driven the price of these boards up from the $35 initial price to over $100 for the higher-end versions of the Pi 5 and CM5 today. Luckily, the lower end options, including the Pi Zero 2W, are still readily available for much less. Interestingly though, the Pi 5 in particular has started including PCI Express connectivity. Most boards offer that for an M.2 slot. There's only, I think, two lanes of Gen 3, but still some. Also, some, like this Sanctuary Systems Sentinel Core board, offers a full PCIe slot, meaning that yes, you can, with the right drivers, use a graphics card or an external graphics card with a Raspberry Pi now. Raspberry Pis have an absolutely incredible ecosystem of supporting boards and modules and components, not to mention the software side of things. There are also imitators, especially of the compute modules, which people like Jeff Geerling have tested out to varying success levels. The key thing to know about all Raspberry Pis, and we'll get onto the uh, you know, Pico in a moment, but consider that not a real Pi for the purposes of this explanation anyway, is that they are all actual computers. You install an operating system on them, normally Linux, uh, and then use them like a computer, be that with a mouse, keyboard, and display, or as a headless server. 
The point is that they are full computers that happen to have an accessible way to control other devices over the GPIO pins. Arduinos, by comparison, are not full computers. They don't run an operating system. They really only run a single thing at a time, a single bit of code that you'll write and install on them. The specs are generally more meager. Kilobytes of RAM instead of megabytes or gigabytes, lower power cores and often single core, but for the right project, they're often a much better fit than a Pi. So much so that Raspberry Pi, the company, created their own Arduino compatible board, the Pico. Now they did go absolutely all out and design their own damn chip for it, but still, it's a microcontroller board with a bunch of I.O. pins. It runs whatever code you put on it, and that's it. There's no display outputs, no USB ports besides the programming and serial ports. Everything is done through the I.O. pins. This is pretty typical for an Arduino compatible board, although that phrase, Arduino compatible, is an important distinction. See, Arduino do make their own boards, the original Uno and its many revisions, the Nano, MK, MKR, Mega, and the bunch of other boards that are now deprecated like the Leonardo, Pro Mini, and Lilypad, and many people make clones, like direct clones of their boards too, but also thanks to Arduino opening up their ecosystem, there are thousands of different board options for you to choose from. Adafruit and SparkFun are two of the most popular makers, with Adafruit in particular making their Feather, Itsy Bitsy, and Metro boards. Arduino as a platform simplifies the development experience, abstracting and automating away the insane amount of hassle that comes with trying to write code for a specific microcontroller. It abstracts the commands needed to interact with the microcontroller and the I.O. pins into standardized functions. So no matter what actual microcontroller you're putting the code on, running digital writes will toggle the given I.O. pin high or low. That level of ease of use means people heavily gravitate towards Arduino compatible boards. In fact, people like me, my own hardware, the open source response time and latency testing tools, are both technically Arduino compatible boards. The former uses a SAMD51 microcontroller found in Adafruit's M4 lineup, namely the Itsy Bitsy M4, and the latter uses a SAMD21, which again Adafruit uses with their M0 line, namely the Feather M0 Basic. These chips especially the ARM ones that I use, are still remarkably powerful and versatile. They have a whole bunch of digital interfaces like SPI and I2C, and there are plenty versions that can do CAN bus, Ethernet, I2S, and more. These are the sorts of chips that you'd want to use if you're making an embedded device. Like, your car has a whole bunch of these microcontrollers in it. When you, like, press your window switch to roll your window down, the microcontroller in your door module takes that signal and then outputs a command to the window motor to move it. You wouldn't want an entire operating system running that, you know, just to do that sort of stuff. You have relatively simple inputs and outputs that you want to control with logic. That's it. There are also plenty of these boards that support Wi-Fi or similar wireless protocols. The Pico W can run a web server, at least a simple one, can send MQTT data over Wi-Fi and way, like, so much more, all from a little microcontroller, which is really cool. Oh, and there are also hats for Arduino, although they call them shields for a bit of differentiation. These are sort of the, the modules that you can clip onto the headers. Or for some board designs like the uh, Seed Studios Zhao boards, these sort of, the boards clip into the modules. These add functionality, things like motor controllers, sensor arrays, or even basic displays. You don't have to use it on a shield though. You can, or at least there are countless sort of modules available that connect via wires instead, including entire ecosystems worth of options like Stemma, QT, and Grove. Or you can just design your own circuits and wire them up yourself like I do for my tools. As for ESP32, 
Well, that's where it gets interesting, because ESP32s are Arduino compatible boards. In fact, Arduino themselves make an Arduino ESP32. ESP32 is just the chip, or more commonly module, that you're using. They are a bit of a standalone platform too though. Most of these other boards, you really only ever want to use them with the Arduino IDE, but with ESP32s, you might run ESP Home or make them Zigbee or Matter devices, which you can now do with Arduino, uh, video in the cards above if you're interested, or program them directly with the ESP IDF. They are arguably the most common Wi-Fi microcontroller. Like, if you buy a product that offers Wi-Fi and app connectivity, like a fridge or an air conditioner, odds are it has an ESP32 or a clone, likely a Toya module. Um, Toya is a Chinese like smart tech maker, and besides the big name brands like Samsung and Philips, basically any other like smart home tech you buy, Toya probably either designed the whole thing and it's rebranded, or at the very least they supplied the microcontroller module for it. I should also mention that, much like Arduino, ESP32 is actually a family of chips with all different features. Some of the like, sub-variants are really cool though. The S3 is a sort of standard dual-core version, the C6 can do both Wi-Fi and stuff like Zigbee and Thread, or this H2 can just do lower power Thread or Zigbee, and the new P4 is insanely powerful. When trying to choose a microcontroller, it can be a little complicated and daunting, as between the myriad of chip options and board designs, there are thousands of just boards to choose from, all with different features and benefits. As an example, while the ESP32 is an amazing chip, if you want to be able to capture analog voltages, say from a light sensor to measure response signs or latency, it sucks. It's slow, low resolution, and not entirely useful for that. Whereas the SAMD51 that I use can do a million samples per second at 12-bit accuracy, or 67,500 samples per second at 16-bit accuracy. Well, that's much better. What you will need is to uh, what you need to do is to work out what requirements you have for your microcontroller based on your project, and then go from there. Although if you are just getting started and want to have a fiddle with just an Arduino type device, an Arduino Uno R3 or Nano is a fantastic shout. If you decide that your project is a little more complex, maybe you want to have a display output for something like a magic mirror, or need more processing power, then a Raspberry Pi in its various forms might be a better fit. But if you just want to make desk blinking lights in, Arduino or Arduino compatible boards are for you. So that is hopefully an explanation of the difference between Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, or at least Arduino compatible boards, and ESP32s. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. I will hopefully be having a video on this Sentinel Core board uh, fairly soon. So feel free to hit the subscribe button if you don't want to miss that. And if you want to check out my own hardware, the open source response time latency testing tools, and soon to be the peripheral testing tool, head to osrtt.com. That's linked in the description. You can also check out plenty of other videos on the end cards, including that Zigbee one using these little Seed, uh, seed Studio Zhao boards. These are really cool, super tiny. Um, and yeah, otherwise, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.